Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Kimmage, Professor of History at Catholic University uh, and Chair of the Advisory Board of the Kennan Institute uh, and host of the Longview Conversations, which are efforts to get behind the headlines and, and deeply into topics uh, related to Russia and to the post-Soviet space. And it gives me a uh, great, great pleasure today to introduce uh, our guest, our guest of honor. Uh, this is Maria Littman, a visiting scholar at George Washington University uh, and co-editor of Russia Post, uh, which is also uh, put out by George Washington University. Uh, before going into the conversation or directly into the conversation, I did want to thank Lenny Lapato, uh, Victoria Pardini, and the staff of the Kennan Institute for making this uh, possible. Uh, and now let me just briefly outline the conversation. I think it will run for about 45 minutes between Maria and myself, uh, and I'll pose a series of questions uh, to her, and then the conversation will be very much open to our audience. So please do send in uh, your questions to the Q&A function, uh, and I will read them out uh, to uh, to Maria. So, you know, if you have questions now, by all means, send them in, or if, if they start to uh, come to you in the course of the conversation, and I'll offer a few more prompts uh, in the course of the conversation to get questions from uh, our audience. And so this is um, clearly a moment of urgency uh, and uh, drama when it comes to domestic Russian uh, politics. Uh, and I wanted to just briefly outline the questions uh, I'll be uh, asking, and then I want to, to ask the questions. I want to go back in time, uh, and I want uh, to ask Maria to provide a sort of composite portrait of Russian politics over the last, let's say, two and a half years. And I'd like to start before February 24th, uh, 2022, get some sense uh, of the relevant uh, transitions, uh, look at the interactions between state and society, which I know is an abiding interest uh, of Maria's, and incorporate where relevant uh, issues related to the diaspora uh, and to opposition Russian politics as they function sort of within and outside of uh, Russia's borders. And then, of course, uh, with the death of Navalny still very much uh, in people's minds and in the news, uh, uh, as we'll discuss, Navalny has not yet been uh, has not yet been buried. We'll 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 move on to that topic uh, and then speak about you know sort of possible fissures uh, in uh, the Putin regime and elements of strength and cohesion that remain uh, within uh, within the Putin government uh, and within uh, formal official uh, Kremlin politics. So with that by way of introduction, let me once again uh, welcome uh, Maria to the uh, to the long view. Uh, and uh, let me start in with the, the first question, which is a kind of general and impressionistic one, is if you could sketch the political scene in Russia, uh, prior to the 24th of February, 2022. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, um, Kennan Institute, for inviting me. Thank you, the organizers, and of course, all those who are listening to us now. Uh, indeed, uh, this is a very charged moment in every way, and I think we will talk about Alexei Navalny's burial and what is happening around it uh, a little later in the conversation. But uh, to Michael's question, uh, if we look back uh, um, almost exactly two years before February 24, 2022, when Russia, Russia's long, um, uh, Russia's large scale invasion began, well, I would, say, I would say the most important change from a human perspective is that Russia was not at, at war. And tens of thousands of Russian men, most of them young, and Ukrainian men, most of them young, were still alive. And uh, 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 just, I think we need to think about these numbers. Uh, just very recently, a group of Russian media um, uh, reported that, according to their estimate, at least 75,000 Russian men have been killed in the war. Uh, this is not an official estimate. This is the result of a consistent and continuous effort by a group of Russian media who are based on facts and on registered facts, such as inheritance cases, such as uh, death certificates, and such as um, reports in local press, uh, a very... Uh, uh, 
um, difficult and meticulous effort that they've been uh, engaged in. So according to the estimate, at least, and this is very important, these are 75,000 men with their names, dates of uh, birth, and dates of death. Um, according to uh, President Zelensky, um, 31,000 Ukrainian men have been killed. Uh, well, how accurate uh, this estimate is, this number is, um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, now, uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, Russia and Russian politics, um, up until the war began, up until Russia invaded Ukraine, um, Vladimir Putin could still be described as a spin dictator, as opposed to a fear dictator. This is a terminology introduced by um, academics, Dan Trisman and Sergei Guriev, uh, and I think it speaks for itself. A spin dictator uh, is based uh, mostly on propaganda, uh, although, of course, not only propaganda. Uh, uh, there were repressions, too, in Russia. Um, but uh, a fear dictator, of course, speaks for itself, and this is what Russia has become in the past two years, with uh, uh, con continuous crackdown on any expression of dissent, any expression of anti-war sentiments, with improbably long uh, hor horrendous uh, um, jail sentences for offenders. Uh, and uh, with basically a ban on any kind of public expression if it is it has even a touch of disloyalty. And we're talking here about expression of disloyalty such as uh, posts on social networks, such as graffiti, such as uh, maybe even single person pickets. So nothing is allowed. Um, up until the war began, there was still a degree of freedom of expression um, and some kind of independent social as opposed to political activism, especially in cultural and humanitarian sphere. Uh, a crackdown uh, had begun in 2012 in response to uh, mass anti-Putin protests and uh, 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 that included the uh, infamous foreign agents legislation and quite a few people jailed. Um, and of course, uh, uh, Alexei Navalny himself was jailed before the war began. Um, but still, uh, we, uh, we were talking about, again, a degree of freedom of self-expression in dozens of non-governmental media that operated and uh, uh, produced highly professional uh, uh, reporting, including investigative reporting in Russia. So all of that, all of that ended in uh, 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 within days, within days or weeks after uh, after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Thank you so much, Maria, for the uh, the rather stark, but um, I think very clear portrait of the dividing line uh, that begins to form on the twenty fourth of February, uh, twenty twenty two, and in a sense, as with all wars, the sense of before and after, uh, but the particularities of this sense and the transition. Uh, that you outline from spin dictator or spin dictatorship to fear dictator uh, and to fear uh, dictatorship. It's with these distinctions in mind and with the sense of this transition point in mind that I would like to move to my second question, which is really about what happens after the war has begun uh, and not on the territory of Ukraine and not maybe primarily in the uh, military sense, but what happens to official Russian politics, I could break the question to, uh, into two parts. How does the Kremlin change? How perhaps does Putin himself change uh, because of the war? And then acknowledging that there's much more to Russian politics than the Kremlin, how does the world around the Kremlin shift? Uh, how does the political world around the, the Kremlin shift uh, because, of the, because of the war? Uh, if we talk about... Um about uh, Russian official politics. Um, we should be talking about a shift to an absolute loyalty of the elites um, and further expansion of Putin's power, even though, uh, you know, back two years ago, it uh, uh, would be even impossible to uh, see how 
much farther, uh, how much broader uh, this, this expansion can be. However, this happened. Um, nothing else matters in Russian politics today except Putin's will. And all others, whether legislators, administrators, executives of any level, are reduced to mere executioners of his will. This applies to uh, officials very high and, of course, lower as well. Um, uh, the elite, as uh, uh, political scientists say, uh, have lost their agency. Um, and this is a very important, and this is uh, one reason uh, um, why we uh, 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 can describe today's Russian political system, political regime, as a dictatorship, as a uh, uh, reign by one dictator. Uh, and the loyalty to the leader, of course, implies uh, pledging allergen allergiance to the war. Um, uh, uh, and all of them do. And uh, there is no way for anyone. There has been no dissent whatsoever among the Russian elites. There have been a few instances, very few instances, of members of the elites uh, who have left uh, and mostly these are people not of the first or even second tier. Officials who have chosen to leave Russia quietly and without making any statements whatsoever after um, uh, they left their motherland. One way to look at uh, politics inside Russia is uh, that the political sphere has expanded and uh, um, uh, by this, I mean what I have touched upon briefly in my response to the first question. So any public expression that uh, um, has to do with the war is considered political, and uh, anything that uh, actually disagrees, any disagreement with the official line is seen as a crime. Uh, it can be fines, uh, but mostly and increasingly we're talking of jail about jail terms and longer and longer jail terms for those to, who disagree and who dare express their disagreement in public. Um, if we talk about the um, um, unofficial politics, um, well, it was very scarce even before the war mostly informal groups and figures, people who would refer to themselves as oppositionists, who would uh, hold public discussions, who would express themselves in non-governmental media. But all of this has disappeared. We don't have any of this anymore. And uh, uh, this happened again in a matter of just a few days and weeks after the war began. Uh, and a major, a major shift was the fact that non-governmental media almost stopped to operate in Russia. Dozens of media outlets have, uh, have relocated to a range of countries outside of Russia. Hundreds, a rough estimate has it at about 500 journalists have also left in what was still a vibrant uh, environment of non-governmental media, um, of course still exists, but uh, it operates mostly from abroad. Very, very few uh, media that do not follow step in step the governmental line are operating from Russia and all of those are being very, very cautious. Um, and of course, uh, you know, if we touch just very slightly on the uh, economic sphere, uh, Russia has been shifting quite powerfully to the war footing. Um, we are not uh, uh, fully there yet. Uh, uh, if um, we use the Soviet Union as a model, the uh, militarization of the Soviet economy was much broader and more extensive than the uh, militarization of the Russian economy today. But the economy has shifted toward a war footing quite substantially. Which, um, uh, as analysts like Michael, Michael Kaufman have observed, is a shift that could outlast Putin himself and be really quite uh, long term and, and dictate certain modes uh, and modalities of Russian foreign policy. Uh, I'd like to just linger over this question of, you know, sort of official, unofficial uh, Russian politics under the star of uh, uh, of this particular war, uh, and to ask about two uh, aspects of this. 
the first is pro-war sentiment. Uh, and you and I have both written about anti-anti-war um, attitudes, which I think are prominent in all countries during war times. You know, very rarely do countries wish to lose wars. Uh, and that's one part of it. But I'm also interested in what might be sincere pro-war sentiment and how widespread and, and, and how significant that might be. Uh, and then secondly, since we're doing something of a historical review, just to, to comment on Prigozhin's mutiny, it's not quite a year. Uh, I believe it was June of, of 2023 when it occurred, uh, but we're coming on the one year anniversary of that, um, a highly interpreted event when it occurred uh, and understood to be potentially a transition point uh, that I think is harder to argue uh, at the present moment. But if you could comment on pro-war sentiment or anti-anti-war sentiment uh, and how Prigozhin's moment of anarchy looks uh, eight, nine months after it occurred. Um, well, uh, this takes us to uh, uh, a, uh, an important issue of um, how do we uh, know uh, about uh, sentiments in Russia, public sentiments in Russia at the time of war. Um, I would say that I do not share the uh, um, outright skepticism of some observers um, uh, regarding public opinion polls. I think actually public opinion polls uh, do give us uh, uh, important information. Um, if we're not based on just uh, one question, one answer, do you support the war, do you not support the war, uh, and uh, uh, you know, based on that, speculate about the Russian public opinion. Uh, there is plenty of data that enables us to see that, um, in fact, uh, um, there's been a, a stable, rather stable distribution throughout these uh, these two years. The number of those who can be described as uh, warmongers, jingoistic supporters of the war, is estimated to be at about maybe 20, 25%. And it is important that the majority of those people are older men, uh, men who participate in the war only by watching television. Mm -hmm. This is this is important. These are, uh, the, this is a constituency that um, will never uh, be part of the actual fighting. And among this constituency, warmongers constitute a majority. Uh, the uh, the number of those who support the war and say, uh, yes, I support, uh, uh, when they're asked by a pollster, is estimated at about 75-80%, um, and uh, uh, some of them are not staunch supporters. Uh, especially women are considered to be not very staunch supporters, but they usually say uh, it's... Uh, uh, alarming, it's disquieting, disturbing that the war goes on, people get killed, but then, you know, uh, maybe there was not indeed, as Putin has said repeatedly, and other officials have said as well, there was no other, uh, other way. Uh, we were forced to engage in this war, and many people in focus groups then uh, add, uh, but what do we know? We are just simple people. I mean, you know, little man, little woman, I, 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 I cannot uh, uh, judge by myself. Um, what is important is that... Um, uh, uh, people in Russia still uh, have an opportunity to turn their backs on this disturbing and disquieting development such as the war in Ukraine. The government does not demand people to be passionate warmongers, passionate patriots. Uh, it's enough for the government uh, for people not to be a hurdle. And uh, this has been the Kremlin's policy all along, ever since Putin became uh, a Russian president uh, over 20 years ago. And people are not a hurdle. And what you described as, uh, and uh, what uh, you and I wrote about in, um, in one of our pieces, the anti-anti-war um, perception is fairly common. So a person may, uh, may actually disapprove of the war or feel, feel disturbed. Uh, but this does not mean that uh, they would approve of uh, uh, active opponents. Um, it is safer to turn one's back 
to uh, cut out your small world. Russians are very good at that. They have a, I would say, well, some would say enviable, some would say deplorable ability to carve out uh, uh, the small world for themselves and adjust. And this is the perception. Uh, pollsters have noticed, uh, and we have this evidence from various polling organizations, um, that more people, uh, and this is a very significant shift, significant increase in those who would want, who are in favor of peace talks and who would want the war to end. However, when the question is asked whether um, mm, they would also agree uh, to uh, territorial concessions to Ukraine, that is, give back to Ukraine what has been occupied, the answer is uh, uh, a vast, vast majority of those who are in favor of peace talks would say no. So it's important when you look at these numbers, which may look encouraging, but still people believe that what's ours is ours. And Putin himself just recently used this word uh, gains, which in Russian is zavoyevanya, exactly gains. He never, I don't think he ever said that before, but he used this word now. And this is how many people in Russia see these occupied, occupied territories. So that too is important. And also, um, Putin, as, Putin as an uncontested leader is seen as uh, the one who should end the war. If the war is to end, it is up to Putin to hold talks. If there are talks, Putin will, will hold them, and he will not make concessions. So talking about uh, um, talking about uh, um, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin's mutiny, which actually enjoyed reasonable support in Russia for a matter of maybe a day or two when his uh, march on Moscow continued. Of course, he never reached reached Moscow. You know, there were, uh, um, uh, there is uh, uh, there can be two ways to look at it. One is uh, a mutiny, a mutiny by armed people headed by a butcher, headed by a horrible butcher who demonstrated his brutality and, you know, verbally and otherwise uh, during the war when he was still alive, of course. Um, uh, can be seen as a uh, uh, as an indication that the regime is vulnerable. If a mutiny is possible, maybe somebody somebody else will. You know, if Pigorzhin could do it, maybe I would. Uh, I can do this too. But uh, um, of course, it can also be see, be be seen as how uh, efficient the Kremlin is at. Uh, managing setbacks. And if we look back at 20 plus years of Putin's leadership, you know, their setbacks have been a great, a great deal. And uh, the regime has managed, has coped, and Putin's uh, approval rating has never gone uh, below 60%. So, um, these are two ways to look uh, at uh, Prigozhin's mutiny. And uh, he is not remembered anymore. The event itself went into oblivion. A uh, brief uh, rise in popularity in public opinion polls that uh, Prigozhin uh, in, in enjoyed is over. Yes, that's, um, you know, very, very uh, striking uh, and um it would be an interesting exercise to go back and read a lot of the analysis that came out uh, at the time, probably a somewhat humbling exercise uh, for things that were, you know, sort of predicted and uh, and expected from that uh, uh, from that uh, from that moment. Uh, let me pause just for a second to appeal to our audience to send in questions to the Q and A function, uh, and we'll be happy to address them about twenty minutes from now or so. Uh, and uh, you know, always happy to get. Um, the expert questions of uh, of Canon Institute uh, audiences. So please, at your leisure, uh, send those uh, in. Uh, and I'd like to move on to another uh, question, uh, Maria, less so about um, Putin and uh, and uh, and the Kremlin, and more about uh, opposition uh, politics. And I would like to break this question into two parts uh, as well, and ask first about what opposition politics. Um, signifies and means within Russia itself. Uh, perhaps it's subtle, hard to detect, uh, and not especially overt, but um, uh, you know it's certainly there uh, and demands our careful consideration. And then uh, since the war has begun, uh, there was a sizable Russian diaspora before the war, uh, it's quite a bit bigger 
Uh, now you've already mentioned uh, independent journalism taking place, uh, written by Russians, but uh, you know, sort of being written and published uh, outside of uh, outside of Russia. Journalism is maybe only one part of the of the of the story. So, what does opposition politics look like, or what does the politics of opposition look like outside of uh, outside of Russia? And you know, maybe we could speculate also a little bit. This is, I think, a difference between the Cold War uh, and the present, that borders of information and borders of communication are now certainly more porous. And so, you know, Russia and the diaspora uh, are more linked now than they would have been 40, 50 years ago, which is, uh, you know, also a point perhaps to, to mm -hmm. consider. But opposition politics within Russia, opposition politics in the broader Russian, uh, broader Russian scene. Yeah, opposition uh, inside Russia uh, does not exist anymore. Uh, I think at this point in time, we can draw this conclusion. And uh, 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 I mentioned this earlier, we have uh, uh, public expression of uh, anti-war sentiments by very brave people, people who, are, who know what uh, um, might happen to them and most often does. Uh, so uh, uh, even the... Uh, the tiniest expression of anti-war sentiment is punishable, and a person uh, runs a very high risk of uh, going in jail, and this has happened to quite a few people. So I would say opposition does not exist. Uh, uh, sentiments, of course, exist, and as I mentioned already, well, probably, you know, a quarter of the Russian population uh, share anti-war sentiments, uh, maybe without any reservations. Uh, uh, without saying that they up there know better and uh, uh, I'm not to judge. You know, there are people who are anti-war, no question about that. Um, so uh, those among uh, the uh, uh, most prominent opponents of uh, uh, Putin's dictatorship uh, are either in jail, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we know the names. Uh, it was up until almost two weeks ago, uh, first and foremost, Alexei Navalny and Vladimir Karamurza and quite a few others. Uh, and uh, uh, many of those uh, who used to have political ambition, um, people who were smart and had interesting political minds and good ideas and were good speakers are currently abroad part of the uh, first immigration wave um, after the uh, after Russia's uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 um each of them is an opponent and uh, uh they have a constituency of their supporters abroad uh, we're talking of uh, mostly about the first wave of immigration uh, that followed the war in late February and early March 2022, lots and lots of people, um, hundreds of thousands, left Russia uh, for political reasons. Some of them were more active. Some of them may have been not active at all, but uh, 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 sympathizing and supporting uh, active opponents. Uh, but they're currently abroad, and... Uh, um, they have scores of gatherings, uh, public rallies <clears throat> in many of uh, the foreign foreign capitals, um, conferences, seminars, uh, lots of publications. But I would say that they are hardly of political relevance for today's Russia. And if we look at it historically, uh, you know, uh, it is. Uh, a rough estimate would have this current wave of immigration as the fourth in the past 100 years. The first uh, uh, was the one that followed the uh, Bolshevik Revolution and uh, uh, the uh, um, defeat of the whites, the anti-Bolshevik forces after uh, um, uh, the Civil War. And that emigration probably had uh, the highest expectations of how they can make a difference in uh, uh, in Russia and how it would evolve and how they would actually conquer the Bolshevik regime. I'm saying that because those were many of those people actually had fought in the civil war and had defended their vision of how Russia should be uh, with uh, arms in hand. 
However, um, as we know, they made no difference in how the Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union evolved. And uh, the same can be said in the following uh, waves of immigration. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think also the current one. I don't think that uh, uh, all those uh, you know, uh, wonderful people, many of them really brave and, uh, as as I said, having interesting political ideas. I do not think that they will be of political relevance in how Russia will evolve in in the in the near in the near future. It is true that um, compared to the Cold War and compared to um, uh, the uh, uh, um, so-called foreign voices, foreign radios from the Voice of America to our Radio Liberty and the BBC and Deutsche Welle and some others, uh, there is a difference between uh, the impact of those media on the Russian, uh, on the Soviet minds, on the Soviet people and uh, the um, uh, um, non-governmental media uh, which have found themselves abroad these days. And I think it is of... Um, uh, the difference is of two diff different qualities, in a sense. Um, you know, uh, 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 at the time of the Iron Curtain, uh, many in Russia, well, you know, the estimates vary, but some have it at 18 to 25 million in the Soviet Union, who listen to those radios as the voice of truth. Uh, assuming that everything that they are uh, told by the official propaganda, by the official media and uh, politicians, leadership, uh, was a lie. Um, and also those uh, uh, media outlets, the foreign voices, were also a source of knowledge about uh, the cultural scene, uh, first and foremost, rock music. Um, so they... Uh, th this was something that people religiously listened to. Many, many millions, tens of millions of the Soviet people listened to on a daily basis. Um, uh, overcoming, by the, by the way, overcoming the jamming uh, by, uh, by the Soviet Union. Now, uh, today we have on the one hand, the porousness that you mentioned. Uh, it is so much easier today uh, to, uh, um, listen and read and watch non-governmental media broadcasting and uh, uh, reporting from abroad. Uh, but the perception, uh, I think, has changed. And uh, the audience is limited to those who still believe that uh, uh, those media are the voice of truth. Uh, uh, Soviet uh, propaganda was coarse and heavy hand handed compared to propaganda of today. And the uh, Cold War was uh, still cold, whereas today uh, we are in a, a real hot war and uh, uh, in which Russian people die. And I think this uh, works to enhance the effect of domestic propaganda. And this also, in my view, um, actually diminishes the impact of the non-governmental media, uh, some of which I think are doing tremendous, amazing work, uh, given that they are operating from out of Russia. But the audience is limited. And the fact that they are bro broadcasting or, or reporting from abroad, um, I think too many is uh, uh, something that uh, makes them less credible um, or maybe with time, less interesting. The emotions of war is a, a theme that's sort of threaded through your uh, your your comments uh, and uh, I think shapes this uh, particular problem set in very uh, in, 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 in very interesting ways. And if we had you know a full hour and 15 minutes to talk about opposition politics in, in Russia, I think we could delve into the question of institutions and what sort of institutions are vehicles of opposition politics. And that seems to me to sort of restate your point in somewhat different terminology seems to me one of the real built-in dilemmas of the Russian opposition, that there's sentiment and ideas and charismatic personalities, but institutions are, um, for reasons that are somewhat obvious, very, very difficult to, to build up. And that serves as a uh, as a profound impediment for you know, posing structured alternatives to uh, to the to the current government or the government 
uh, as it is. Uh, this takes us, I think, inevitably, and you've you've mentioned the name Alexei Navalny. I think he deserves a question uh, unto himself in this uh, in this conversation. I was somewhat taken aback by the scale and scope of international media coverage uh, of uh, the occasion of his uh, death, and couldn't quite tell whether the international media framing of it was that this is the beginning of something possibly new, or if this was the end of an era. Uh, I couldn't quite figure out where the narrative was was going on this. And I'd like to ask you about, you know, since we have limited time, maybe to speculate mostly on what this event signifies within Russia itself, uh, what it signifies uh, to Putin, what it signifies to Navalny's many, many viewers uh, in Russia, many people, I think most Russians are aware of who he is uh, and have a sense of his personality uh, and agenda. And then, of course, questions of opposition politics or alternately questions of loyalty to uh, the Putin government uh, and the Putin state, uh, you know, sort of come into play. So very curious to get your thoughts on on, on the figure of Alexei Navalny at the present moment. Um. Yeah, I would still start with the most recent news. Uh, I think this morning it was reported that uh, uh, Navalny's family, uh, Navalny's associates have coordinated his burial, uh, which in itself I think is uh, uh, noteworthy and uh, noteworthy. I mean, uh, the, the fact that uh, the family, uh, Navalny's mother and Navalny's parents could not bury him for almost two weeks after his death is just beyond outrageous. And uh, uh, um, so uh, uh, it was reported this morning that um, uh, the, uh, uh, the family um, has announced uh, uh, the church, uh, the location of the church where the funeral service will be held. So this is the church located in the part of Moscow, uh, the, uh, the district of Moscow, where Navalny and his family lived. And uh, um, um, at this point, uh, the uh, particular cemetery, the name of the cemetery is announced uh, where he is uh, expected to be buried. Uh, this is one of uh, Moscow's largest cemeteries in the Southeast. Uh, I would still, uh, uh, not rule out some unexpected developments at the last moment, but this is what we heard. The day of the uh, uh, um, funeral service and uh, the burial is March 1, so two days from now. Um, uh, lots of Russians uh, are grieving. It is very hard to say how many of them inside Russia. Um, uh, 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 but um, uh, even uh, you know, within hours after the uh, uh, um, day uh, of his burial has been announced, uh, uh, it was reported that uh, at least one Moscow university uh, warned its students that if anybody takes part in any public events, it is not specified what kind of events. Um, you know, it's like implied um, they will be immediately expelled. So this is a warning to at least one university, and I'm sure that uh, it is just the one about uh, 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 which we learned. I'm sure similar warnings have been issued in other colleges, other universities as well. I would uh, remind that for a student, a young man who is expelled from school, uh, from a, a college or university who has the deferment, um, uh, he, he loses the deferment and can be drafted. Uh, so this is a serious, serious warning. Um, now, uh, um, as to whether uh, Navalny's death will invigorate um, uh, oppositionist sentiments in Russia, I doubt it. And I do not believe that this is be the beginning of a new era. And I do not believe that people will rise in like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and take to the streets. No, we haven't seen it in the previous days after his death was reported. There were people who were trying to lay flowers um, uh, in various places across Russia uh, under surveillance, strict surveillance of the police. Um, and they did not come in throngs. They did not come in tens of thousands. Uh, and uh, uh, intimidation works. And this uh, uh, um, dictatorship of fear is fairly effective. So I would not expect that uh, the tragedy, the gigantic tragedy of Navalny's death 
uh, will uh, uh, actually start something of a new political movement in Russia. It is very important that um, no matter how broad um, anti-war or anti-Putin sentiments are, maybe you know people do not talk about it and refuse to talk to pollsters, and maybe we do under underestimate how broad these sentiments are. Um, there is no organization in Russia, not even anything, you know, remotely close that people can identify with. No leadership, no leaders, no organization. And uh, um, without uh, such a thing, sentiments in a in environment of broad and hard intimidation uh, cannot be a factor of um, anything uh, like uh, a political movement. So I'm delighted to see the questions coming in uh, rapidly. I think a record setting number of questions for a long view uh, conversation, and I'll be sure to ask as many as uh, as time allows. But I do have two final questions uh, of my own. Uh, and the first is on the first of my final questions is on uh, the presidential election uh, in March. Uh, and it seems to me that the easiest way to interpret this moment is as a, a ritual of regime perpetuation. Uh, you know, obviously there's not uh, an array of parties or, or, or viable candidates who are, uh, who are competing. So it certainly does have aspects of a ritual, but I wonder if this isn't in some ways too superficial. And so, you know, you can think back to the election, presidential election of 2018 or the presidential election of 2012, uh, 2008, 2004, these are all, uh, important moments, they're sort of um, uh, segments on, on a continuous trajectory. And I'm, I'm, I'm eager to get your thoughts about the upcoming uh, presidential election. If there's more to say about it, then it's, you know, sort of uh, just uh, a bit of spectacle and a bit of theater because that's required at the present moment, but has no meaning beyond that. Um, I would say uh, it doesn't have any meaning beyond that. And uh, I would remind our listeners that uh, Russia, last time Russia had a competitive contested election at the federal level was 1999. Maybe with some reservations in 2000, Putin's first presidential election. But, uh, you know, 99 we had, in 99, we had a uh, parliamentary election that was truly contested. And uh, that was uh, the last time. And, uh, uh, you know, compared to uh, uh, Putin's previous re-elections, uh, let's uh, call it this way, uh, this one is, uh, well, probably even more preordained. Uh, and uh, um, Putin remains an uncontested, omnipotent, and increasingly feared leader. Uh, the election will go as planned, which is it will be a plebiscitarian exercise in which people are expected to uh, uh, come to the polls and approve Putin as the leader. And it will also be uh, uh, in uh, um, a case for um, Russian administrators of various levels to excel each other in demonstrating how uh, they are uh, efficient in delivering uh, a higher vote than your neighbor, you know, <laughs> region, uh, regional governors, you know, uh, demonstrating, reporting that in my region, it was 80% and in my neighbor's region, it was only 78. Um, there were some uh, um, allegations made some, well, reportedly, uh, the Kremlin administration uh, um, uh, has a plan of something like uh, around 80% turnout and something about the same, 75 to 80% vote for Putin. We'll see. Uh, um, uh, that was reported, uh, that plan that they have to fulfill was reported a few months ago, so we'll see how it goes, but it should be higher than uh, six years ago uh, to show that Putin has even uh, um, broadened his support in Russia. Um, so it will go as planned. Uh, and uh, there are all kinds of ways to uh, uh, correct, quote unquote, correct the results uh, if they do not live up to the expectations. And electronic voting that was uh, introduced in Russia uh, a few years ago uh, now turned out to be a convenient tool for falsifications. So I don't think we should expect any um, anything unexpected from this election. 
So sometimes the conventional wisdom is right, uh, and when it is, <laughs> it's worth acknowledging it as uh, as such, and 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 not going out in search of overly elaborate explanations for things that are rather clear. Which takes me to my final question, which sort of touches on the war, but uh, on the war from a domestic political vantage point. And it seems to me that both. Ukraine and Russia at the moment face uh, a rather similar problem when it comes to the war, which is that to perpetuate it and to make progress, whatever progress might mean on the battlefield, they're going to have to mobilize. That there's maybe a acute manpower power problem uh, for the Ukrainian military at the moment, but from some of the assessments that are at least semi-credible or credible about the recent battle for, for Avdiivka, uh, Russian casualties and deaths have been uh, immense. That was the you know, the very first thing that you mentioned in our conversation today, the cost in lives of this war, uh, and for Russia to take and hold a meaningful amount of additional territory in Ukraine would probably require mobilization or steps that lead uh, in that direction. So my final question is, it's more speculative, a question about the future, what that might look like. It does seem to me that you know, Putin's management of domestic Russian politics is sort of technically perfect at this point. He sort of learned how to do it. Uh, and it's a machine that seems to run by its own volition, at least uh, outwardly. But his management of these matters has been much more nervous and uh, um, uh, imperfect. And so the mobilization of fall of 2023 was, I think, a moment of, you know, domestic political turbulence in Russia, such as such as it's been uh, since the start of the war. And you can see how Putin would be reluctant to go down the path of mobilization uh, now. Some of these balances, the somewhat more skeptical women, the maybe more skeptical younger generation, Moscow and Petersburg is perhaps less uh, enamored of the propaganda reading of the war than, than other parts of the country. These are all sort of held in check and held in balance at the present moment, but that balance might begin uh, to wobble or to differ uh, if there were to be another round of mobilization, or perhaps he could simply fold another round of mobilization into the existing justifications for the war, and it would work out uh, without too much difficulty. But that's my final question. So the domestic politics of mobilization at the present moment and, and how that might look in the next in the next few months. Yeah, indeed, uh, the mobilization that Putin called uh, um, when uh, uh, Russia's situation at the front uh, did not look to be encouraging, to say the least, and this was the fall of uh, 22. Um, so uh, uh, the mobilization actually showed that the Russian people were um, uh, really disturbed, really alarmed by the situation. This is, by the way, what uh, public opinion polls uh, showed as well. That was the time when uh, emotions such as alarm uh, have gone up and people were really disturbed. And as we very well know, uh, at that time, um, uh, uh, a great number of young men uh, um, took effort to flee Russia, uh, which was quite quite uh, 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 quite broad, and to uh, uh, fleeing to various countries, uh, a second wave of immigration since the uh, beginning, since uh, Russia's large scale uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, I would say that the Kremlin would do everything to avoid another mass mobilization, or at least to improve the way that mobilization was called, because it was, uh, as uh, all the decisions that were taken early in the war, very poorly prepared. Uh, uh, Putin does not like, to say the least, to inform his uh, uh, those who take his orders, to inform them ahead of time so that they could get prepared. Um, uh, that caught Russian officials, um, including military officials, uh, um, almost unawares. Uh, the mobilization was chaotic. People were, there were roundups in the streets of Russian cities and, and towns. Um, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, that was when uh, uh, Putin's rating went down a bit. And uh, uh, there was every indication that uh, the, the, uh, the Russian people are very strongly disturbed by that. So I think uh, that uh, uh, the Kremlin will do its best to avoid any such thing in the future. Either it will be much better organized so that, you know, any Russian man, man who is not yet fighting would not be afraid of being uh, stopped in the street and sent to the front. 
So it would be better organized. And maybe, you know, it would not take um, immobilization uh, um, of that scope. Uh, I think the Kremlin by now has uh, figured out various ways to replenish uh, the uh, uh, the force, um, the Russian force, the Russian soldiers who are fighting and who are dying in great numbers. Um, so this is uh, um, um, how 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 I see it. Um, um, also, uh, something that you mentioned is that um, uh, the number of men who have been mobilized uh, varies a great deal region by region. Russian media um, uh, um, have put together a very uh, uh, um, a map that that shows it very clearly. You can look at the map. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, for those who are interested, I strongly suggest that they take a look at it. It shows regions of Russia and for each region how many men have been uh, um, fighting as contract soldiers, as those who were mobilized and otherwise. And the disproportion is crying with, as you said, the large urban centers such as Moscow and St. Petersburg having a very small proportion of, of men uh, who, um, who are fighting, who have been fighting. Um, whereas uh, poorer provinces of Russia, and especially ethnic republics, some of them uh, uh, have a much higher proportion of men who are, have been, uh, um, who were drafted or mobilized or otherwise and uh, sent to the front. The, uh, uh, the reason is obvious. Uh, big urban centers are places where people are most likely to uh, organize rallies, to organize protests, at least this is uh, the way it used to be uh, um, before the Kremlin grew as repressive as it is now. Uh, and also poor provinces can be, I um, mean, in, uh, it makes a uh, difference, um, uh, the, the uh, generous compensation by the government to the men who are fighting and to the families um, who lose their loved ones. Uh, and it makes a difference in poorer regions. Well, uh, I'm gonna turn now to audience questions. We have many, many of them, but don't hesitate to send in more if you have them to the Q&A function. Uh, I'm gonna start with Jill, Jill Doherty, a good friend of the Kennan Institute uh, and um, uh, a wonderful journalist uh, with, uh, with deep experience covering uh, Russia from inside and from without. And uh, her question is about Prigozhin, uh, who she characterizes as a monster, no doubt, but also raised the issue of the elite's impunity and their children, who said that, um, uh, uh, who he said were not fighting and dying in Ukraine, meaning the children of elites were not fighting and dying in Ukraine. Does this accusation have resonance in Russia right now? Is there any way of measuring this? How worried might the Kremlin be about this? Does it have any similarity to Navalny's accusation against Putin and corruption? So you spoke, uh, Maria, earlier in our conversation about the loyalty of elites, you know, sort of in lockstep about the war. Uh, this goes to questions that the Russian might, population might have about, um, you know, the sort of insularity of elites and overstepping or uh, them not paying the price of the war when when normal people uh, do. So thank you so much for the question, Jill. Um, uh, thank you for the question, indeed. And uh, um, um, well, it is not that. Uh, uh, well, oh, let me begin differently. Uh, of course. Um, uh, children of the elites uh, um, or the uh, the parents of those young young men try to uh, prevent them from being sent to the front. But it, it should be noted that actually it is not that we have across the board mobilization. We do not. And lots and lots of uh, people of um, conscript age, conscription age have not been mobilized. There are all kinds of deferments uh, for uh, many categories of uh, men who work in the military uh, industry and uh, people in um, uh, information technology who are have been and remain uh, in high and higher demand. So there are all kinds of ways to uh, um, uh, hide your your son from being sent to the front by uh, uh, you know. Uh, organizing a uh, good job for him. And uh, this is what uh, uh, I'm sure um, uh, this younger generation of the elites have had even before the war. 
they are also most of them right in in Moscow and in large urban centers, uh, uh, children of the elite and the elites themselves. So it is not so very conspicuous in Russia. And uh, 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 there is, I would emphasize that there is no sense in Russia that the whole people has risen to conquer the enemy. It's not that. Uh, actually, as again, I mentioned, uh, you know, it is quite possible to live with your back to the war. And the government does not require this passionate patriotism of uh, uh, the whole population and pledging their you know, broad, broad, broad allegiance to the war on a daily basis. So I would, I would say this is not uh, a factor in the public discontent. Um, and uh, uh, besides, you know, there is uh, an exception of the fact uh, that uh, the elites live better than we are, that they enrich themselves at people's expense, and that uh, they would want and provide for their offspring something that we do not have. This this is a fact of life, which actually, I mean, this sense of disparity and uh, injustice has been smoothed down a little bit uh, because of the generous compensation of the families um, who uh, have their loved ones, their sons, brothers, husbands fighting in the front. There is evidence, statistical evidence for that. Okay, we have so many questions that I'm going to try to bundle them together so that everybody's in one form or fashion gets asked, although I may not be able to list your uh, name. I'm trying to sort of get a sense of the categories of uh, of questions, and there are several. I'll just lump them together. Uh, excuse me for doing so. Those who uh, put their excellent questions in the Q and A box, but I will lump them together about foreign reporting about the war, foreign voices. Um, you know how the Russian public might be gaining access to this. Other versions of what <laughs> uh, from what they see on on, on television. And to what degree is this uh, a factor? You mentioned, and we discussed the porousness in terms of the Russian diaspora and how their ideas, articles, podcasts, videos uh, are pretty easy to get a hold of, but maybe not uh, broadly influential. Uh, this is a question not so much about that, but about foreign voices and sort of alternative readings, I suppose, uh, of the war and, and what kind of currency these might have uh, uh, with the Russian public at the moment. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, I wouldn't talk about uh, uh, foreign information sources because there's plenty of Russian information sources. I mean, uh, those journalists who uh, left, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, several hundred, according to some estimates, five hundred, about five hundred journalists, uh, dozens of publications have relocated. Uh, and for anybody who wants to know. Uh, there is no shortage of information. Uh, it is not that uh, um, Russian people do not have a way of getting the information. It is a matter of how much you want to know. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, among those uh, who, are, of course, are supportive of the war, this makes no difference. They are not interested in alternative sources. They assume that all of that is a lie, like uh, the Russian propaganda is telling them. But among those who are... Um, who may be uh, disturbed by the war, who find uh, uh, this whole uh, uh, war with a close neighbor, a uh, bloody war in which many people die, so disturbing as, you know, the most natural reaction of many people is to turn their backs on the war and learn less, not more. Not because they cannot, but because they don't want to. Because, you know, when uh, something disturbing is going on and there is nothing you can do about it, it is a natural human reaction that actually um, enables you to remain sane. You know, try not to think about it or try to think as little as possible about it. So the constituency in, in uh, Russia, which is uh, very closely watching the war based on uh, the sources of uh, um, Russian non-governmental media now reporting and uh, writing and broadcasting from abroad, it is this audience is limited. And I'm not sure if with time it is getting larger. My sense is that it is more likely that it is slowly getting smaller. Okay. Um, there's a question. Uh, I find it uh, stimulating because there's such obsessive concern with the matters of age 
and mental acuity when it comes to candidates uh, Trump and Biden uh, in the 2024 presidential election here in the United States. But the question is about not so much Putin's age and mental acuity, but uh, that Putin has been in power for a long time. It's a demanding job. Uh, are there any signs, perhaps, uh, that he's sort of struggling uh, to do it, or that age and you know, sort of physical health is is um, uh, is is a factor? Obviously, this is kind of stuff that's on the caliber of a high state st secret in Russia. Putin's possible diseases and uh, you know his his physical health is a kind of stylized version of this, uh, and it's hard to get, I think, much information uh, beyond that. But uh, you know, Putin, I think, is seventy two years old. Uh, at the present moment, uh, are there any things that are uh, of interest in terms of his age and, and the long length of time that he's been on the job? There were indeed rumors about uh, uh, Putin's ill health a while ago, and I think William Burns, the uh, head of the CIA, personally uh, said that those rumors were not justified. I think he made that statement many months ago. As for Putin's age, you know, from an American perspective, we're the kinds of uh, candidates of your uh, incumbent president and uh, 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 his contender. <laughs> I think uh, Putin looks young. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, I uh, don't like this question because I happen to be exactly the same age as Putin, same <laughs> year, same month. So not yet 72, 71. <laughs> his birthday is in October, uh, just like mine. He's, uh, he'll turn 72, and he seems, uh, you know, in very good physical health. Uh, and now in the uh, uh, lead up to his presidential election or quote unquote election, he's traveled a lot around the country. He's uh, met with people, even though, of course, he doesn't need any campaign. This is probably to enliven the public sentiments prior to the election. But other than that, he doesn't need to campaign. He doesn't have any rivals to think about. And uh, uh, But I think he's in very good health. He is athletic. He, of course, uh, has... Uh, um, any kind of medical assistance, medical care he wants. Um, and uh, I don't think we should lay expectations on that, that he will, you know, decline because of uh, because of uh, of his age and, and, and what died. I don't think that we, we should be actually lay laying expectations on that. I mean, I thought that he looked sort of unwell at the time of the war. Uh, and maybe what you can say in retrospect is that the strain of the first few weeks of the war did have something of a physical effect that you could sort of see in videos and and, and photographs, but that's, um, you know, sort of very much of the past. And so I think it's, uh, you know, uh, important to emphasize uh, exactly what you just, uh, what you just said. The second question, uh, or sort of another question, um, I'm sort of merging here, two questions. One was about periods of repressiveness in Russian Soviet history coinciding with periods of anti-Semitism. Uh, is that the case at the moment? And then um, the force of Eurasianism in Russian politics and the role specifically of Alexander Dugin, is this something to, you know, sort of credit as being uh, important and, 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 and consequential, or is it uh, maybe something that's just more stylized uh, and on the surface? So Eurasianism and anti-Semitism. Um, I uh, I think there was a trend uh, in uh, um, Western and American media to uh, uh, exaggerate uh, Alexander Dugin's role in Russia, and even uh, he was even uh, referred to in some publications some time ago as Putin's favorite philosopher. I think uh, uh, his role and his uh, um, um, influence has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, uh, Eurasianism, I wouldn't pay any attention to. I, I think it's it's an interesting, it was, it is an interesting philosophical trend. Uh, but uh, um, if we're talking about Russian politics and how decisions are made and what, what Putin is uh, um, motivated by, I don't think this is a factor. Um, what is important is indeed um, Russian ethnic republics and the rise, I would say, moderate rise of nationalism in uh, those territories uh, because of the war and because, as I mentioned, uh, um, men have been disproportionately 
uh, uh, mobilized and uh, uh, sent uh, uh, sent to fight, um, and uh, the men disproportionately died from those uh, generally poor territories such as Bashkortostan, Buryatia, Kalmykia, some others, uh, and there are signs of um, nationalist sentiments on the rise in those territories. Uh, this has led some observers to be talking about Russia, the, the, uh, the risk of Russia disintegrating, which I think is totally not uh, um, unsubstantiated, um, which I don't think there is any reason for uh, expectations that Russia might disintegrate. But the government seems to be um, actually um, keeping track and concerned about uh, um, uh, nationalism in those territories. There are signs that, um, you know, the government is uh, actually uh, uh, concerned about emphasizing, and Putin, by the way, uh, uh, first and foremost, emphasizing that Russia is not uh, an, a nation state, that Russia is a multi-nation state. Uh, Putin has repeatedly, in so many of his speeches, including recently, has emphasized this point, uh, that, that we are a, a nation uh, um, whose uh, um, diversity is, as Putin put it at some point, our beauty and our strength. So uh, the government totally is, is, is uh, 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 keeping track of those developments. Um, and uh, um, I... Uh, I think this is an important factor, and because of ethnic cohesion in those territories, uh, there were instances, especially at the time of the mobilization of the fall of 22, when there were um, expressions, public expressions of anger and protest over mobilization. Um, so uh, what I uh, uh, would reiterate, uh, uh, the Kremlin is savvy in uh, coping with setbacks and in coping with problems. And this is not a problem that the Kremlin overlooks. As for anti-Semitism, I don't think, well, there were um, episodes and uh, one of them was in the Gestan and it had to do with uh, a rumor at the height of the uh, 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 Middle Eastern crisis. There was a rumor that spread around that uh, um, Jews from Israel were coming to that Republic of the Gistan to settle down. And there was a very ugly uh, mass protest, mass rally uh, that sounded really uh, 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 anti-Semitic. But that was but an episode. I don't think this is an important uh, phenomenon, an important factor uh, in, 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 in Russia right now. So I'm going to ask the last question now, just for purposes of uh, of time, uh, and it takes us in a somewhat different direction. So I think it's a kind of good concluding question. And I think you've done, Maria, so much to help us understand the system that's at work uh, and how it's arisen, how it's been modified, maybe radicalized to a degree by the war and where it stands uh, at the present moment. And the question here is about overreach, where it might be possible for Putin to overreach. And I think if you would look historically at these kinds of uh, governments, I know that you and I have discussed Spain under Franco as as one a government that one might compare to, to Russia's current government. Uh, and you can bring in many other examples and analogies. But with similar governments, overreach is an issue. That you can cross certain thresholds uh, and societies that can seem very quiescent and obedient and loyal can suddenly become different. I don't think anybody would predict that of Russia in the next six months or next year or next several years. Uh, and yet it is uh, a kind of interesting question to consider. So this is a hypothetical question is what might overreach look like? Uh, and what might be areas in which uh, Putin could overreach? Yeah, it is very important that uh, you added to this question that, of course, we don't know the uh, immediate future, and uh, I would not expect any kind of dramatic events of uh, the kind that you've outlined and overage in the uh, next few months or even a year. However, uh, um, of course, uh, um, the uh, 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 there is um, there are many factors that undermine uh, uh, Russian development. 
and push Russia's development backward to a degradation, uh, economic, social, and otherwise. There are demographic factors that are very, very important. We haven't touched upon the issue um, in this discussion, uh, haven't touched upon the issue of the young, but the generation of the young, people who bear the brunt of this war is a very small generation. Uh, it has to do with the trends in Russian uh, demographic developments over the decades, but uh, uh, this is the truth. The generation that is entering the uh, um, childbearing age and uh, the uh, uh, entering the workforce is a very small one, and it is exactly the generation that uh, is now uh, uh, um, whose members are being killed in the war um, uh, and uh, the generation that will have much fewer children than they would have had without this war. So that's that's very important. Economically, of course, as we spoke, uh, Russia is uh, uh, drifting further and further toward the militarization of the economy. And uh, uh, of course it is under unprecedented sanctions. Uh, um, it, it does not have the effect of, uh, you know, Putin surrendering or admitting that he's being defeated by the West, just the opposite. But all of these take a toll on the Russian economy and the, the Russian socioeconomic development. Um, the uh, um, uh, elites may be uh, um, uh, totally loyal to Putin, uh, but it does not mean that uh, they are a cohesive force among themselves. And there is more and more reason for them as uh, there are instances of nationalization of industrial properties, many more of these cases uh, in the past year alone. So uh, there is, uh, um, um, uh, I think, uh, the, the, the atmosphere in the relations among the elites uh, can get more um, hostile and, uh, you know, trying to enrich yourself at your uh, uh, peer's expense. Um, that too may be a factor of undermining. So uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, overreach is a very good, uh, uh, um, I think very apt term to express it. Russia's managing, Russia's managed amaz amazingly better than it was expected at the start of the war, and especially as it was helped by those who were introducing, um, designing and introducing sanctions. Um, uh, however, uh, they are the sanctions and uh, the war and uh, uh, um, losing, losing uh, young Russians um, uh, is taking a toll. I would, unfortunately, uh, I would not uh, uh, dare, I would not take the risk of envisioning just how it might evolve, but this is a very important factor to watch, that's for sure. Well, Maria, for, for balancing the contingencies with the inevitabilities uh, throughout your remarks and providing a, a remarkably rich portrait of the political story over the last uh, couple of years uh, were very much in your debt. So first and foremost, would like to thank you for joining us uh, today uh, to thank our audience members for their stimulating questions, to thank the Kennan Institute for uh, its support of this event, especially Lenny Lopato and Victoria Pardini. Uh, there will be future such long view conversations. Uh, so for those who are fans of the long view, please stay tuned. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you.